Okay, then welcome everyone to a weekly colloquium of the Physics Institute of the UNAM in Cuernavaca, Mexico. It's a pleasure for us that we have today Thomas Prozen from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia here. Um, yeah, let me say some, some few words about the Vita of Thomas. Um, so he made his doctoral degree in um, uh, uh, Slovenia at the University of Ljubljana, where he is also now a full professor, I think since 2008. Um, yeah, his um, main research interests are in open uh, quantum many body systems and uh, exactly solvable systems. And yeah, just to mention um, some prizes uh, which he obtained recently, there's the Alexander from as the Bessel Award from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and um, an advanced grant from the European Research Council. So Thomas, thank you very much again for accepting our invitation and um, yeah, joining us today and yeah, working late night for us. I think it's in Slovenia, it's about 8 p.m. right now. And yeah, we are looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for inviting and for kind invitation. So, um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> let me start. Uh, I will talk about, uh, I mean, the title, as you see, is exactly solved models of many body quantum chaos. So it's a kind of uh, uh, beginning of my kind of old dream coming true, essentially. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a basically a threat of, of, of the work, which started like three years ago together with these two heroes down there, uh, Bruno Bertini and Pavel Kos. Pavel Kos is my current PhD student who just handed in his thesis. So basically what I'm talking to you now is basically his PhD work over the last three years. And uh, this was largely assisted also by a postdoc in our group, uh, <clears throat> Bruno Bertini. So, and uh, just to give you a short menu of what I'm trying to cover in this, uh, in this talk, is a bunch of recent papers, uh, basically two PRLs and a PRX and SciPost publication, uh, which uh, basically report results, uh, which I, I, I told you already, I mean, I find personally very exciting because it's kind of my, 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 my dream coming true in a sense, because, you know, um, I started kind of working for my PhD. I worked on a quantum chaos in single particle problems like billiards and so on. And, uh, you know, I was always dreaming of, you know, what should be really the, the corresponding uh, <clears throat> properties of corresponding quantum chaos properties of many body systems. And um, <clears throat> in particular, you know, for those of you who have, who have studied the chaos, classical chaos theory, you know, there are these paradigmatic examples of Baker maps and cat maps, which are exactly solvable, which you can teach in a class on a blackboard, right? In 20 minutes, you can solve for correlation functions of cat maps and Baker maps, right? even though the trajectories are algorithmically complex and means that they are unpredictable. But, you know, statistically, these models are exactly solvable, right? So this is what I have in mind by ex exactly solvable models of quantum many body chaos. Namely, I was kind of missing for, you know, the last 20 years of my career, I was kind of dreaming of a, a theory which would be quantum many body analog of, let's say, Baker and cat, map, cat maps. So models which would be non-integrable and chaotic, let's say they would be following random matrix uh, spectral statistics, but uh, they would be solvable in a sense that, you know, you could prove that they follow random matrix, for example, or you could even compute correlation functions. And that is sort of the agenda of my, 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 my colloquium today. So to present you with some, I mean, some simple ideas, you know, how, I mean, or even simpler models, I mean, around these models, we build simple, simple, simple methods, right? Uh, which allow us to prove some random matrix properties of these models and uh, even to compute correlation functions that is to, 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 to build, let's say, er ergodic hierarchy of, 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 of dynamical, dynamical behaviors of these models. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me just, I'm sorry since, okay, I understand this is a colloquium and I should not be too technical, but you know, I, I, for me it's very hard to give you anything which is non-technical. So uh, please bear with me. I mean, there will be a couple of formulas. I hope they are not too, too I mean, I try to be kind of more pictorial whenever I can. So most of the ideas I try to convey in terms of pictures, but you know, I have to 
I have to give you the formula first, you know, just to give you the definition of what I'm talking about. Even though, I mean, probably I could even draw pictures here, but, you know, <clears throat> but anyway, I mean, I, I understand that some of you are already quite familiar with this concept and for those who are not, this is a very simple concept. So what I'm going to discuss is the spectrum of a many body quantum system that spectrum, uh, that, that many body system is understood to be like a, a spin chain that is, uh, or a fermionic chain of L sites, which means it has uh, uh, dimension. Okay, in this case, dimension of the Hilbert space is denoted as curly M, which in many body system would be like exponentially large in number of sites or number of particles. And uh, imagine now we have a, 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 a Floquet system that is periodically driven system with some periodically depending on the periodically uh, periodically uh, <clears throat> time dependent Hamiltonian. Then you can define a one period time evolution operator, which is usually referred to as Floquet operator, and you diagonalize it. So you, you look at the spectrum. Yeah. So the idea is to make, basically make first a statistical mechanics theory of spectrum of a unitary evolution operator, right? So you consider this phi sub n, which are the eigenvalues of these many body unitary operators, consider this as, as particles on which are confined to a box of period two pi with periodic boundaries, right? Because these are, these are eigenphases. So they are points on a, on a circle, on a, on a, on a, on a, uh, <clears throat> on a ring of, of circumference to, to pi. <clears throat> so that is how you define the, 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 <clears throat> the spectral density. And then you define pair correlation function, two point function, which is just uh, Kind of symmetrized or, or, or integrated uh, two-point uh, density density correlator, right? Uh, and it, it is defined in a way that you subtract the, the connected. So it's a connected correlation function. So you subtract the average, average square, um, <clears throat> the square of the average, which is by, by construction equal to one by definition. So I mean, this is just you know just consider. I mean, this is like a one D stat mech. You have a gas on a, on a, on, a, on a circular uh, on a circle. You define two point function, and then what you do in the next step, you define a spectral form factor, which is that just a Fourier transform of this two point function. So you just take a Fourier transform of that R of theta. Theta now is the difference coordinate. <clears throat> you take a Fourier transform, and now since this is this 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 coordinate is uh, again a, a point on a unit circle, so that is with periodic boundaries, it's from zero to two pi. So the Fourier transform, the va Fourier variable is an integer, right? And this integer has meaning of time. It's a number of revolutions or repetitions of your Floquet driving, of, of, of your Floquet protocol. So, I mean, that is basically what enters in the argument of the spectral form factor. So the time, remember now for us is discrete, yeah? I mean, this is of course, you know, I could just start from, you know, Hamiltonian dynamics and then this time continuous and then you could define a corresponding spectral form factor with continuous time. But, you know, all this is kind of totally analogous to that, but in discrete time, it's kind of simpler and more kind of easy to treat. So let's consider time discrete and then this spectral form factor, which is just the Fourier transform of the spectral two point function has this expression. So it's a double sum, right? This is a, just a simple straightforward calculation. It's a double sum over uh, e to the i t difference of the phases. <clears throat> and now this of course is just the modulus squared of the trace of the evolution operator, right? Because the evolution operator has eigenbases e to the i t phi, phi sub m. So I mean, this is just the trace of u to the t <clears throat> modulus squared. So but that's very nice. So it means that, okay, if you can compute uh, a trace of your dynamics, I mean, this is kind of uh, average uh, 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 <clears throat> return probability or return amplitude, if, if you want, uh, averaged over random states, because you can represent trace as an average of random states. Uh, if you compute, if you have some access to that dynamical feature, then you can also, also describe, discuss uh, 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 spectral, prop I mean, spectral correlations of eigenvalues. <clears throat> I mean, correlation properties of eigenvalues. Now, the, there is one caveat, of course, which one has to uh, which one has to stress immediately, which is that this quantity has no meaning unless you do some averaging. So this quantity is not self-averaging, and one has to do either moving time averages, for example, I mean, which is you know the method of choice if one want to stick with individual dynamical system, or you take an ensemble average over some family of dynamics, right? I mean, we don't want to, I mean, at least in my talk, I try to discuss models in which this averaging is very, very innocent. Meaning that I take a small ball of systems in some parameter space, and I even let this ball shrink to zero. That is, you know, radius of this ball going to zero at the end. So I really want to basically consider this averaging just as a technical tool, not, I mean, I don't want to consider these other systems. <clears throat> 
Okay. <clears throat> so now let's first see what random matrix theory teaches us about the spectral form factor. Again, in the context of uh, discrete time dynamics, I mean, random matrix theory, this is, in the, this is called uh, then circular or Dyson circular ensembles of random matrices. And uh, one knows, of course, that this should correspond to discrete time dynamics with or without time reversal. Namely, when you take a circular unitary ensemble of unitary matrices, then this corresponds to cases without time reversal. And then you can basically compute this spectral form factor or, the, or this expectation value of spectral form factor simply by hard averaging over the unitary group. And this integral can be computed. You can find it in any textbooks on random matrix theory and you find this linear RAM. Yeah? So this is the, the, the characteristic feature of, let's say, chaos, quantum chaos is the linear RAM for spectral form factor. <clears throat> And that linear M should resist, I mean, for let's say absent systems without time reversal should persist up to the so-called Heisenberg time or up to time which equals the Hilbert space dimension. So the, again, remember curly N for me is the Hilbert space dimension. So this also has a meaning of time scale, namely this time scale corresponds to, to, to the inverse mean, uh, level, level spacing, mean level spacing. And uh, yeah, and uh, be beyond this time, of course, then, you know, <clears throat> you can, beyond, beyond, beyond this time, you can treat these phases as random numbers. So then the RAM should stop and you get the plateau. So, I mean, then if you have this uh, unitary ensemble, you have this linear uh, form factor and then a plateau. If you have systems with time reversal symmetry, then this uh, form factor is a bit more subtle. First of all, there is a factor of two, which comes from time reversal symmetry. And then you have a slope, which is two in the beginning, RAM has slope two, but then if you have a smooth connection to the plateau, again, around Heisenberg time, which is equal to N. And I will not say anything about the symplectic case. <clears throat> and uh, what I want to stress at this point is that usually what people expect is also there is a time scale after which actually this agreement, now, of course, this is what happens in random matrix theory, but if you look at what happens in real dynamics, in real dynamics, of course, you have some very short time scale in which uh, dynamics is very much model dependent. Right, I mean, it depends on uh, yeah the structure of classical phase space. If you want to have classical limit, but if you have a many-body system, it depends on details of the interactions. Uh, this is what is expected. Of course, I will tell I will tell you that you know it doesn't, doesn't always happen that there is anything like non-universal regime. But what people expect based on decades of studies in quantum chaos that there is this Ehrenfest slash Tauless time. I mean, I'm saying that there are two names because some nowadays this would be usually referred to as Tauless. In the old quantum chaos literature, this is usually referred to as Ehrenfest because it was related to semi-classical limit and small h bar. <clears throat> in any case, there seems to be a time below which there is no universal physics and only afterwards linear arm starts and uh, you can get uh, uh, an agreement with random matrices. <clears throat> of course, I mean, I didn't say, but you know, please feel free to interrupt me if there is any question. I, I, I don't know what is the what is the, 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 the style of colloquium you prefer, but I, I'm happy to answer questions during the, during the talk. Anyways, <clears throat> anyway, I'll, I'll try to make a bit of introduction just in order for, you know, for people who are not familiar with the subject to, to get acquainted. So uh, let me just now give you another two, three minutes of introduction into the old questions of quantum chaos and how I got basically stimulated to think about this problem and also why, I mean, the whole community of quantum chaos where you know, also people in, 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 in Cuernavaca are experts and pioneers of. I mean, all these, all these, all these problems were kind of inspired um, or at least uh, uh, started in the late 70s, beginning of 80s, uh, when people started to look into uh, spectral statistics of simple problems like quantum billiards, single one particle problems. And uh, they used the idea of Wigner to use random matrices to model spectral, spectral, spectral correlations of that, those simple systems. But you know, the reason why these simple systems should have statistics, uh, I mean, the levels should have statistics described by random matrix theory is probably more interesting than, you know, for complex nuclei, because complex nuclei are interacting many body systems, you know, with, you know, messy interaction structure. So you're not surprised that they are kind of similar to random matrices, but, you know, when you have a billiard or a Laplacian on a, <clears throat> on a simple domain, then of course it's much more much more surprising perhaps that uh, what people found uh, is that the spectral statistics are given by random matrices. Yeah. So this this kind of observation, which was uh, due to these people here in the in the in, in, in under green, is uh, usually referred to as quantum chaos conjecture, or some people refer to it as Bokiga-Jones-Schmidt conjecture. Uh, and 
it was really probably the, the main question which drove the field of quantum chaos for I don't know, at least two decades, I would say. I mean, there was this uh, 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 kind of slow, but you know, persistent progress on this question, which started, I mean, the idea was how to explain that, of course, is there, is there a, a, let's say, a, a dynamical derivation of random matrix spectral statistics yeah, in chaotic uh, systems? <clears throat> And that was the kind of a program, a tour de force, which was actually started by, by observation of Barry, uh, which is the so-called diagonal approximation, <clears throat> which is very easy. I mean, just imagine, you remember what I gave, what I told you that the spectral form factor is just trace of uh, power of the evolution operator to power T modulo square, right? Now imagine that you have a system which has a classical limit. <clears throat> then uh, you could uh, write uh, the trace of the evolution operator in terms of Feynman path integral, right? where you get uh, e to the i as over h bar, where s is a classical action. So then you use your favorite stationary phase approximation, and then you get uh, to the stationary points, which are just uh, classical trajectories, right? So then what Barry proposed is that basically this trace squared should be replaced by a double sum of periodic orbits. Now in this case, where you have discrete time dynamics, these are exactly periodic orbits of period tau. And here you have an exponential the phases uh, sorry, the actions, yeah, the phases, which are the actions over each bar over a lot of these orbits, and then times some multiplicative prefactor, which is not important for, for our purpose now. The point is that, you know, Barry observed that, you know, there would be a leading contribution to this double sum when there would be constructive interference between these two terms, which means that, you know, one picks up, picks, 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 picks these, these terms uh, where SP is equal to SP prime, right? I mean, this would be giving you the dominant contributions where there is this exact cancellation of these two phases. <clears throat> so this is the so-called diagonal approximation, and this gives you exactly, I mean, this gives you the positive contribution, which is a single sum, and due to the sum rule, which is also known as Osorio del Maida Hanai sum rule, this is, again, I mean, it's just a restatement of ergodicity in classical phase space. This is exactly given as T or 2T. I mean, these two coming from time reversal symmetry, meaning that you have to also pair orbits, not by itself, not when P is equal to P prime only, but also when P is equal to equal to time reversed P prime. So, I mean, that's the simple explanation of factor of two. <clears throat> okay, so now that this is the, you know, the, the, the explanation of the ramp and this was already in 85, so many, many years ago. And then, you know, people were trying really to understand whether they can do better. And there was lots of discussion and it was not clear for a long time whether it can be done until uh, 16 years later, there was this groundbreaking paper by Martin Zipper and Klaus Richter who explained this uh, second order contribution to spectral form factor in terms of, let's say, topologically more complicated uh, trajectories, periodic orbits, which are these so-called number eight orbits, which experience the so-called self encounters. I mean, of course, I don't want to go into any details here and it's not my aim to go there because my uh, uh, context later will be completely different, but you know, there is some similarity. I mean, okay, I mean, at least uh, yeah, <clears throat> conceptually, there could be some similarity. So, it's maybe no good to, to mention these old results, but still, I mean, not, not going to any detail, this gives the second order contribution. And then there was this finally, I mean, a few years later, um, there was in a group of Fritz Hacke, Sebastian Miller, who was his PhD student at that time, and uh, several other people like uh, Alex Altland and Peter Brown uh, were involved. Uh, uh, and they completed finally this program, uh, you know, by uh, expressing any old, I mean, expressing basically the, 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 the complete expansion of spectral form factor at, in, in the power series in H bar or in time. And they found that uh, the nth order term is given by uh, a class of orbits which experience nth, uh, order n of self encounter. So it's a kind of a systematic diagrammatic perturbation theory in, in H bar, if you want, which expresses spectral form factor exactly in terms of a random matrix result. So this was a big success. I mean, uh, and uh, probably it's my, probably the main kind of, uh, uh, probably the, I would say it's arguably the, the, the main result of quantum chaos of single particle physics, even though one has to stress that this is not a rigorous result. I mean, from the perspective of mathematical physics, this is still heuristics, yeah. Uh, so there are still, still work for mathematical physicists. That's what I want to say. <clears throat> it's not uh, that it's finished story, but you know, for from the point of view of theoretical physics, it's kind of a, uh, achievement and result. Anyway, but uh, my, my, my kind of talk and my endeavor is not about uh, systems with small h bar, but I would like to discuss systems where h bar is kind of maximally possible, which is like a, a one, 
if you want, or uh, this is usually realized in fermionic systems or spin one half spin one half chains. So chains of particles with spin one half. And I'm just giving you kind of uh, a motivation for that. I mean, then again, I mean, this kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of, I mean, when one has enough, let's say, uh, uh, experience in science, then one now knows this interesting kind of cross fertilization of different fields, you know, people are coming from one field to another and so on. And what I experienced, for example, in the last 10, 15 years that people from condensed matter community came and start using these concepts without really understanding what they mean. For example, I mean, there is this, uh, you know, notion of quantum chaos from Vigna Dyson level statistics, which is simply for some people, the definition of quantum chaos. They don't even think of what they mean when they say this is chaotic, but they simply say, oh yeah, this is Vigna Dyson level statistics, right? So this has been so ubiquitous, so 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 uh, common, right? I mean, <clears throat> take you take your favorite condensed matter theory model like this, this spinless fermion model, which has uh, standard tunneling terms and uh, nearest neighbor interaction terms. Now this would be not totally standard because it has nearest neighbor and next to nearest neighbor tunneling and nearest neighbor and next to nearest neighbor interaction. Because if there was no next to nearest neighbor terms, this would be integrable, so no, not chaotic. But as soon as you switch on nearest, next to nearest neighbor terms, Again, this is spinless fermions. So these are fermionic operators. This is number operator and so on. So if you look at level spacing distribution of these models, I mean, I didn't tell you what level spacing is, but I assume you have, or, or, most of you have seen it. I mean, it's something that is much easier to, to, to compute numerically and experimentally at the spectral form factor, but it in principle has the same information. So if you look at the level spacing, I mean, you see that it goes from Poisson for integrable and it goes to Wigner Dyson that is characteristic of random matrices when you have this integrability breaking parameters, which are sufficiently strong. <clears throat> so, I mean, this is, time, I mean, I'm just giving you one example because this is from a review paper from 10 years ago, 11 years ago, but uh, you know, this literature is full of such results and it's kind of very, becoming very common. So, I mean, and um, the question is, of course, are you, I mean, are you puzzled? Why is this so? Because this Hamiltonian, if you just think of what this Hamiltonian is, I mean, how it can be represented in terms of in your computer, this Hamiltonian is a super, super sparse matrix. I mean, for example, you take L sides. This Hamiltonian has just two L or four L elements in each row. And uh, the Hilbert space dimension is two to the L. So it has of the order of log L of log N, if N is the Hilbert space dimension, log N elements in each row. So its sparsity is going to zero if you want in the thermodynamic limit. So it's hugely sparse matrix. And there is no randomness. And there is just uh, of the order of three, four, two or four different matrix elements. I mean, J, J prime and P and P prime. This basically give you all the matrix elements. So there is no randomness and uh, uh, hugely sparse matrix, but still people find that the spectral statistics is given by an ensemble of random matrices by zero, I mean, maximum entropy ensemble of random matrices, zero structured ensembles. So there has to be a reason for that. There has to be a dynamical explanation for that. And that was kind of the idea the, that, you know, drove this kind of, that drives this kind of research I'm telling you about now. So, <clears throat> so how to explain that? <clears throat> find minimal models, find billiards of many body chaos, of which you can really pin the, the, the mechanism of why you know, get these spectral correlations, <clears throat> which are most easily explained in terms of this ramp of spectral form factor. <clears throat> okay, now just to, to go sweet, smoothly to spin chains and to uh, problem of computing spectral form factor for spin chains, I show you this result, which is, uh, from the old paper with Carlos Pineda uh, and myself from 2007. Uh, at that time, it was not so clear what spectral form factor really means in many body systems, whether it can be a useful measure or not. So we just, with Carlos, we just tried to compute it. And this is also very pedagogical because it you know, teaches you what do we mean by spectral form, form factor being non-self averaging. So here, Carlos really plotted spectral form factor with gray dots, with these black dots, you know, without doing any averaging. Yeah? So this is what, what happens. If you just ask your graduate student compute spectral form factor and plot it, this is what you get. You get a mess, yeah? Now, depending on the resolution of your plot, you can either get just black, black, black paper or, or, or yeah. So then what you do is basically do just, I mean, here there's no ensemble. This is an individual system, just one spin chain. I will tell you later exactly what the model is, but this is one spin chain. And then if you just do, moon, uh, just do moving time averages, then you get this black on a, first of all, of course, this model has a rotation, it has translation invariance. So you have to first decompose its obvious symmetries, which is translation invariance. So you get these quasi-momentum sectors, which are these 
symbols, yeah? different colors is different quasi momentum. Uh, but of course, this is already uh, averaged or this is moving time averaged over 50 bins of time. And the system size, I think, is 18. So it's a couple of ten, tens of thousands of time steps. I mean, Heisenberg time is of the order of a few ten thousand. So, uh, so 50 is already quite, a, uh, first of all, enough uh, time window to get smooth data, but uh, small enough to get a good resolution. So then you see you get this black, uh, first of all, you get these points, then you average over quasi momentum, you get this black, black, black curve. And this black curve is excellently agreeing with this red curve, which is the analytic random matrix result. Oh, this is just to, to convince you now that taking, I mean, this is a typical many body system. It's a flow case system, so time is discrete still, but it, it basically excell excellently agrees with, with random matrices. <clears throat> of course, with Carlos, there, at that time we have also checked level spacings, but you know, for the purpose of this, of this, of this talk, I'm not going to say anything about level spacing because uh, I cannot say, I cannot prove anything about level spacings. Because it's a messy distribution, a messy statistics, but let's rather concentrate on the simplest statistics, which is a two point function, which is a spectral form factor. <clears throat> so, and before going to that results, of course, I would like to just, again, give you a little bit of what happened before that, which I'm not going to uh, go through in my talk, but uh, uh, before discussing these results, I mean, my, my, my kind of aim today is really to, to tell you what can be done with, let's say, uh, with mathematical rigor. So let's say what can be proven, right? <clears throat> some, some results which are exact. I mean, the title was exactly solved model. So I, I just want to give you results which are exact. But before that, we actually had a couple of results. I mean, there was one result from our group, uh, again, by Pavel Kos and another PhD student uh, on, uh, again, spin chains, kick spin chains, but with short, long range interactions. And uh, for that uh, class of models, we could actually develop a theory, which was in a spirit similar to periodic orbit theory. And the derivation of spectral form factor was similar kind of to Barry's diagonal approximation plus Ziba Richter corrections. So that's really kind of uh, more analogous to standard uh, Sphema classics, but it's not rigorous. I mean, uh, and we needed long range interactions. So, I mean, that's kind of a half step to the end, to, to the goal, but it's still, I think it was quite exciting. I mean, because we could do it for spin one half chain. And then there was a second kind of line of attack from Oxford, from John Chopper and his group who considered uh, Floki quantum circuits, which are random systems. Uh, which are more like random matrix theory with uh, with the structure with the underlying uh, locality structure. So we basically considered uh, Floke uh, quantum circuits. I will discuss later what we mean exactly by this type of quantum circuits. But they considered lo local Hilbert space dimension, which was a large number. And this is in some sense similar to small h bar limit. I mean, you take a large large number, which is local Hilbert space dimension. So it's like a quantum spin. So h bar is like one over q. So in that sense, this is not kind of satisfactory from the point of view of, 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 of the motivation which I wanted to convey to you. So, but anyway, this is again a nice result. I mean, you know, in this asymptotic limit, they nicely reproduce. And of course, they, they, they also get uh, the, the, you know, kind of the, I mean, they get basically the, the main point of these works is to find what is the tallest time and how does it could depend on the, of the geometry that is one bit geometry of the, of the spin chain. <clears throat> okay, now let me go now I mean, this would be kind of end of the introduction and let me now go into a couple of results um, and a couple of ideas which I want to convey to you. Hopefully, I don't know, I mean, maybe I should. But by the way, I mean, um, will you get me uh, some time marks at some point? I mean, how, how, how long am I supposed to speak actually? One hour or 45 minutes? You have about uh, 55 minutes. So you have 25 minutes left. Okay, good, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so now, uh, let me just now give you the sort of the more uh, uh, detailed uh, definition of the model that I will discuss for the, most of the rest of this talk, which is the kicked easing model. So uh, it is probably one of the minimal models of, of this type. I mean, it's really uh, having just, in, so it's a, it's a local interacting spin chain with easing interaction between nearest sides. And it can be discussed as a kicked model. Uh, so uh, uh, Hamiltonian can be split into two parts. One is switched on and off in terms of periodic deltas, which we call kicks, and one is time independent. And the time independent part is like an easing model with longitudinal random fields. And the time dependent part is the transverse fields. Now you are free to distribute these longitudinal fields with kick or with uh, uh, unkick part. It is really just a, I mean, a simple exercise in, 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 in algebra, if you want. 
it's the same thing, right? It's the same model. <clears throat> uh, you can check this for yourself. So, <clears throat> uh, but it's kind of more convenient now to consider these things together because these are, these are diagonal operators. So these are, can be considered as kind of a classical, classical zinc model. And now this really makes the problem off diagonal, which means it makes it really quantum. It's very <clears throat> induces coherence. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> uh, and then of course, uh, the, the Flocky operator, which is just, just a time order product uh, 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 with this Hamiltonian is just a product of two exponentials, e to the i uh, h kick times e to the i h easy. And there are two main parameters in this model, which is the spin uh, in, uh, interaction J and the magnetic field B. <clears throat> and uh, the HJ are the uh, uh, positional dependent longitudinal fields. And now uh, here comes my, my kind of ensemble of models. I mean, I now want to have some disorder. So I want to have now some randomness, which I will then manipulate later on. But you know, at the, at the outset, I want to have some randomness and this is now hidden in the longitudinal fields. So this AJ will be some IID random variables with some distributions, which have some variance and some mean. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, as I already mentioned, uh, maybe or maybe not, but this model, I mean, has, this is a model is a rather rich family of models and it contains two integrable points. So either the field is purely longitudinal, this, then this model is classical, it's diagonal. So it's really uh, uh, <clears throat> obviously integrable, right? But then if magnetic field, uh, so this would be if B is equal to zero. But if uh, longitudinal fields are zero, so if the field is purely transverse, then this model is, is also integrable because it can be mapped to free fermions. I mean, if you use uh, the Inga Jordan transformation, then this is exactly uh, mappable to free fermions, which is again, integrable model. <clears throat> so, I mean, this is trivial points, let's say, or, or, or semi-trivial. Uh, now for generic AJ and B equal to from zero, this model has no symmetries and it's not integrable. So we expect it to be chaotic. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and now let me just give you some, uh, some, some uh, to start with some uh, numerics of how spectral form factor would look. Uh, <clears throat> so for example, suppose now, as I told you already, these uh, magnetic fields would be IID Gaussian variables with mean H bar and variance sigma. So they would be kind of given, so the spectral form factor now would be given as a, a expectation over these random variables. And these random variables, remember, are the IID, that's important. So it's like a separable distribution of each, I mean, independent random variable, which is a Gaussian, has a Gaussian kernel. And then, you know, you integrate, with this, you integrate K of T with this Gaussian kernel. Okay, so that's, that's the, the object that I want to uh, to calculate later on. But now I'm just giving you a sort of a snapshot of some numerics about this object. <clears throat> so if you just ask your PhD student, you know, to compute this, this is what you get. So um, it's a perfect, nice linear ramp. This would be like, this is this, for, yeah, of course I have to tell you what are the parameters. This is for, let's say system of size 15. So the Heisenberg time is far to the right. So I plot here times between zero and thousand. So much less than the Heisenberg time, but still much more than any potential Ehrenfest or Taulis time. And uh, you see, well, there is nice ramp. And then of course there is different the data sets here, which depends on different, uh, they, they, they differ by different values of the, of the variance. So if it, of the variance of the disordered field. So if the disordered field has a very large variance, which means that it's like a random between zero and two pi, because there is this limit of two pi, because everything is you know, cyclic. So if there is a maximum, maximum random field, then uh, the fluctuations are smallest. But if the, uh, random, if the variance is, gets smaller, then fluctuations of the spectral form factor gets bigger. So for example, this is particularly severe at short times. At longer times, basically there is very small controlled fluctuations, but at short times, the statistical fluctuations get larger. But again, you might think this is a problem, but it so happens that this problem is only finite size effect. So when you take larger and larger system, again, these fluctuations at fixed sigma go down. And that's a, that's a result of uh, analytical theory, which I will dis discuss a bit later. So, uh, but of course, all that nice things uh, happen only when this J and B in absolute value are equal to pi over four. So when, when the interactions and uh, field strength are uh, having, uh, having this, uh, satisfying this, the so-called self-duality self condition. And I will discuss what I mean by that. So this is something which is important. Okay, and uh, now what I will do actually, I will try to interpret this uh, and probably this will be like one or two technical slides, which I want you to bear with me. I mean, for those who basically 
do, do not want to bear with this, I mean, please, please simply ignore it. I mean, I'll try to compensate with words later, but for those of you who want to just catch some ideas of this, uh, of this, of this calculation, maybe it's useful. So I mean, first, the, the first idea is try to express this, this uh, spectral form factor uh, K of T in terms of uh, 2D statistical models. So as you know, there is this deep connection between 1D uh, uh, classical uh, models in 1D, uh, sorry, quantum models in 1D, quantum interacting models in 1D, and, uh, in, and, and, and classical statistical models in 2D with local interactions both. And uh, this you can actually do in this case. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry, I mean, I was just too quick. I just wanted to first discuss what we can prove, but then I wanted to give you the idea. So what we can prove, uh, about this model and this particular set of dual points is that spectral form factor upon this averaging, so this is k bar, uh, for odd times is exactly equal to 2t if larger, if time is larger or equal to seven or it's 2t minus one for times less or equal to five. For odd times and for even times, we cannot really prove things, but we have a well, well, I think well, well founded conjecture. Conjecture says that this spectral form factor uh, is 2t plus one for times large enough. And then there is some short time flux or T less or equal to, to, to 10. Okay, uh, so now, okay, I mean, I, I might uh, be a bit, I mean, I might explain a little bit why there is this difference between odd and even times and it's peculiarity of this model. I mean, actually, I, I might even ignore this because, you know, for the colloquium talk, many of these technical details are probably not so exciting. What is exciting, I think, is that this type of results can be proven even much, in much broader class of models. And this I'm going to go later. So, but anyway, this model is still kind of cute and, uh, you know, I like it and it's kind of historically the first, I would like to speak about it, but, you know, it is a particular model and it is a, has, it has some peculiarities like this even and odd time effects, which are not there for generic self tool models. Anyway, <clears throat> so what we did and what we can do here is basically we can prove the results about spectral form factor, which are uh, for any sigma and they are independent of sigma. Meaning that this model, you know, you have maybe heard that people have predicted many body localization for Floquet systems as well. So for this type of Floquet system, we can sure assure you that there is no many body localization because no matter what disorder, no matter the strength of disorder, if there is this one side disorder, on side disorder, uh, there will be no localization. This model will always be a random matrix. I mean, it will always have random matrix statistics, so that it can never get localized. <clears throat> And uh, so uh, we can take safely at, at the end of calculation or at the end of the day, we can take the limit sigma to zero. Yeah. So the clean, clean system limit at the end and we get the same result. Of course, the order of limits don't commute. So you shouldn't do limit sigma to zero in the beginning because then you have no disorder to average over. And you have a system with additional symmetry which is translation invariance. So don't do that. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, another thing which is kind of cute is that the results are independent even of the average disorder, which means we can say it average disorder to zero, average field to zero, sorry, average field to zero, which means that we are we, we basically uh, expand around the uh, integrable system. I mean, the limiting clean system is an integrable system. Anyway, <clears throat> okay. So uh, let me now just give you two slides of the idea how to calculate that. I mean, that idea is basically kind of behind most of, this, of these tricks. And uh, <clears throat> the idea is the following, as I said already, I mean, uh, first of all, what one needs to manipulate are the traces of the powers of the propagator. So the traces of the powers of the propagator of this kick spin chain uh, look like, and uh, really, I mean, they are technically like partition functions of 2D statistical models. The only problem is that, you know, in general, these partition functions, since they are not written in imaginary, uh, in imaginary time, they are written in real time and for Floquet dynamics, they are, they are basically complex. I mean, so there is, the weights are not real, the weights are complex. So they are not really probabilistic statistical models. They are, they, they are algebraically like statistical models, but they are not, you know, the, the weights are not probabilities, yeah. So it's a bit tricky, but you know, if you are just, you know, interested in algebra and you want to, to devise algebraic tricks, you don't care. So really, you can really think of this as a classical, comp complex classical, uh, 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 classical 2D easing model with random fields, and now this randomness is striped, meaning that these fields are the same at all points in time. This is now time, in this direction, and this direction is space. And they differ from space to space point. So these this, 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 uh, fields are stripes, yeah? the random stripes. So it's a, it's a, it's a non-integrable classical easing model with random fields, which are random just in one of the, of the axes. And the other axis is, is homogeneous. 
So now the question is, I mean, the point is now you can say something about this, this model, why, how and why? Well, because, uh, you know, this trace of u to the t basically means contracting this partition function along columns. So basically the, the, the column transfer matrix is just the Flocky operator. It's just a Flocky propagator, yeah? But now you can just they do the standard statistical mechanics trick and you can just replace row trans column transfer matrix by row transfer matrix. And this gives you the same partition function, but the row transfer matrix is another propagator, which miraculously has exactly the same algebraic form as the kick teasing model. So this is what I call U tilde is another kick teasing model with changed parameters, which I call J tilde and B tilde, which are functions, functions of J and B. So there is a kind of a space time flip or this duality transformation, space time duality transformation, which replaces space and time and changes the coupling parameters J, B with J tilde, B tilde. And now, uh, and there is this, what I call duality uh, relation for, 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 for partition functions. So you can either write it as trace of U to the T or you can write it as trace of the products. Now it's a product because fields are different from side to side, product of, 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 uh, uh, <clears throat> of these row transfer matrices, which depend, which are for constant fields, epsilon is a vector with uh, equal, equal uh, values, but uh, 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 noisy, noisy, so noisy constant fields, noisy meaning that the different steps is a different field, but this, the, the same points, the same at all points. Okay, now I'm not sure if I said too much, too much around this because in a way it's either, either incomprehensible or obvious, I guess. But uh, sorry, uh, but you know, what is, what I think is crucial here is that of course that at some particular points, namely at those points where J and B is equal to pi over four, now this dual propagator becomes unitary. I mean, the point is now this J tilde and B tilde are usually complex. And if they are complex, then this uh, dual uh, Flocky operator is not unitary anymore. But if they are real, then this dual Flocky operator is unitary as well. And that's super cool. I mean, if you have, uh, two guys which are unitary, the standard uh, time evolution operator, which is unitary by construction, and the space evolution, I call it space evolution because it's propagating it's propagation in space, uh, unitary as well. We will later call this dual unitary dynamics. I mean, this buys you a lot. This buys you basically that you can do exact statements. Yeah. And this has been actually noted also, I mean, pro, I mean uh, for in, for uh, on slightly different, uh, in slightly different context, but for the same model, it has been also noted by, by the group of Tom, Thomas Gore, in particular by Bo Boris <coughs> Goodkin and uh, collaborators. Okay, <clears throat> so now what do we do basically now, uh, what we have to do now to compute the spectral form factor, we have to take two replicas of this, of this, uh, so now, this, now spectral form factor is now a two, two point quantity. So you have to take two replicas and take trace of u to the t times trace of u to the t conjugate. So this is like having two, two, two diagrams like this. And then you just truncate, and then you just contract this partition function along uh, rows, yeah? But if you do this along rows, then you can average over fields like this. I like I indicated in this blue shaded uh, rectangle because this is all that depends on H3. And that next row depends on H4 and that and so on and so forth. So, which means that since the field is IID, I can basically average independently each row, even though I take two replicas. These two replicas just means that now my Hilbert space is a tensor product, but now I have an averaging. Averaging means that I have this Gaussian kernel, which is due to the coming from the Gaussian integral, which basically couples these two replicas. So now this, I have this transfer matrix. Now, see, I mean, this is a calculation which is sketchy and I probably I would need 20 minutes to really go into details to explain it. So I just leave it on the slide. And for those who have some experience with this type of calculations becomes obvious for others, maybe, you know, they should really invest some time. But, but I, I think at least the main idea should be kind of clear. I mean, the fact that we can replace space and time meaning that you can basically average over IID disorder. And the fact that this dual transfer matrix is unitary means that things becomes very stable if you contract it over space direction. So now <clears throat> the point is that the spectral form factor now is a trace of T to the L where T is now this double transfer matrix. And now you can go to thermodynamic limit and by going to thermodynamic limit, basically you don't care. You just have to prove that this spectrum, this, this transfer matrix has a gap and that the leading eigenvalue is at one. And then what you have to do is you have to count the multiplicity of eigenvalue one, which gives the spectral form factor. So now the spectral form factor is trace of T to the L 
if you know that there is a gap, this means in thermodynamic limit. And of course, you have to first know that the spectrum of this beast is in unit disk. If the spectrum of this disk is in unit disk, then of course, nothing can explode. Then everything can either contract to zero or stay, uh, stay at one if it's on one, at one. So what we do, and then I will not do this for you, but you can find it in the papers, but what we can do and what we have done, we have shown that there is eigenvalue one. This guy has only one eigenvalue uh, at unit circle, which is eigenvalue one. This eigenvalue can be multiply degenerate and then the degeneracy is, exa is exactly 2t. And the spec, the rest of the spectrum is gapped from the unit disk inside the, inside the complex plane, uh, from the unit circle inside unit disk. So, so it means that in thermodynamic limit, everything else but eigenvalue one dies. So which means that spectral form factor in thermodynamic limit becomes equal to 2t. <clears throat> so that's in words and in one picture, you know, the, this result, uh, which is uh, was uh, was 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 uh, written at the theorem I showed you two slides ago. Okay, now this is just in another sentence what I already explained to you, <clears throat> and I will not give you any 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 additional arguments. So with that, I would now close this uh, part on kick teasing model, and I try now to generalize. I know, okay, first you know you might want you want you, you you might say first I mean this is one simple model, one fine tuned model. You ask this self-dual point, which is very particular point, right? I mean, two parameters have to be fine-tuned. So maybe this is so special I should never care about. So let's now see whether we can basically find a more general class of models for which this dual unitarity condition is true. So now, now let's play a little bit with quantum circuits models, which are also very interesting from the point of view of quantum simulation and coming quantum, you know, quantum computing. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, technologies, right? I mean, this Google's supremacy uh, uh, experiment, quantum supremacy experiment basically is, has been performed on models which are like quantum circuits or models like this. So let me just uh, define as the simplest kind of uh, local quantum circuits models, uh, which are given in terms of two particle gates. So now let's assume now we have D, uh, site, D, D level quantum systems. So uh, each of the local Hilbert spaces has dimension D. D might be considered to be equal to two, for example, for spin one half or for fermions. So, and then you imagine you have this, 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 uh, uh, <clears throat> this, this uh, uh, unitary and this unitary would be like mapping uh, state I cross J to state K cross L, right? And this would be like in state and out state. And in terms of a diagram, this would be like, a, a, like an S matrix if you want, you have two states in and two states out. Now, and I will now plot my circuits. I'm sorry now for the confusion. I will now plot that circuit such that time goes vertically. So everything will be built up in time direction vertically. So now I go, IJ is in, KNL is out, yeah? But now what I will already do, I already did in this formula here, I also defined another way of looking into this picture, which is left to right, which is uh, I, 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 IKL in and JL out which is like just taking things, I mean, flipping things around the diagonal and considering now time going left to right, or now this fictitious time, if you want, going left to right. So now, uh, of course, I started with the unitary uh, circuit. So I started with the condition that you should be unitary, but now I ask, what is the extra condition I have to satisfy that this U tilde, which is defined in this way, which is propagator left to right. Uh, the, the, this way you define this reshuffling or, or tilde mapping. So uh, the, the question is now under what condition and how, you know, how restrictive is the condition that not only U is unitary, but also U tilde is unitary. And we call these conditions, the pair, of the, the, the pair of conditions being satisfied, we call dual unitarity. So we call circuits which are built of such gates, dual unitary gates. And uh, probably I, I'm not sure how I'm going to go with time now, but probably I will not have time to classify these dual unitary gates for you. I might, but... Uh, Depends. I mean, maybe you I have about ten depends. minutes. I have, okay, we'll see. We'll see how we go. But I, before I just uh, go into that, I simply tell you that for the qubits, we can actually classify these gates, and um, and we can convince ourselves or convince you that uh, uh, there is only two. I mean, they basically there are only only two extra parameters to fine tune with res to, with respect to general unitary gates. So general unitary gates of two qubits have 16 parameters, right? It's U4, it's for uh, uh, D square, it's 16. Uh, three parameters, three real parameters, but uh, dual unitary gates with for qubits is uh, two parameters less. There are two extra constraints. So it's like 14 free parameters. 
So it's not very, it's still a very rich family. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, super fine tuned if you want. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, so now having this dual unitary gates, now let's build un dual unitary circuits. So this would be like uh, fabrics like this, space time fabric, like, you know, going from uh, bottom to top would be like uh, starting from, let's say this would be a case, an example for six, uh, 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 so system of uh, land six, which would be like 12 qubits, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on to 12 qubits, which are now propagated for two full time steps or four half time steps, right? I mean, this is now flow dynamics and full time step is like two layers. So this is depth two, if you want quantum algorithm, which is repeated by two times to, to, to simulate the evolution of a flow circuit for the time steps. Okay, so now, I mean, this is now uh, either now, as, as, I told, as I told you, I mean, this I can consider now either as evolution in time, uh, and this would be like this uh, propagator, right? This is unitary propagator, which is composition of u odd and u even. u even is just a tensor product of these gates, right? Because they are independent, but u odd is just slightly shifted, shifted by a, this is a shift operator by, by one side in, on a chain of 12 sides. And then uh, I shift it back, yeah? So then I continue. But of course, you can always define a dual quantum circuit and dual quantum circuit would be something goes left to right. And it would be again now defined in a very similar fashion, but now with this u tilde gate, right? And then again, you have this formula for duality of traces, which is just a restatement that this complexified partition function is, can be contracted using row wise or column wise, yeah? Okay, and now uh, before going to correlation functions, I mean, the rest of the, the talk would be on correlation functions, but before that, I would just like to announce a recent result, which is just two months old, three months, well, a few months old, which we have put on the archive in December, which is a generalization of our kick teasing model result to arbitrary, let's say, uh, uh, to arbitrary quantum, essentially arbitrary to self dual quantum circuits. So this result here is stated for for quantum circuits, which are given by the same gate U and another gate, which is again the same, which is red and orange. These are the two fixed the dual unitary gates, but then they are perturbed. They might be perturbed by some single qubit gates, which are like random fields. And these are like random magnetic fields. If you want, you can, which you can switch on and off periodically on two half layers. And uh, the only condition, this is very general statement, the only condition is that these random fields should be IID and uh, should, should be, uh, 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 the distribution should be such that they have non-zero probability around uh, a small, uh, arbitrary small ball near, ball near identity, which means, well, I don't want to go into to technicals, but it's really, it just tells you that, you know, this distribution could be, you know, could be again, uh, yeah, could be turned off if you want. At the end of calculation, I mean, it's uh, <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to say more, much more about this. Uh, but the point is, I mean, yeah. I didn't want to get technical, but you see here, maybe I just wanted to flash this formula for you because it tells you basically for those who have some inclination to algebra. I mean, it tells you really what you have to do. I mean, how, you problem you map the problem to algebraic problem, and what kind of algebraic problem? You map the problem of computing the spectral form factor. This is the spectral form factor in thermodynamic limit, again averaged over this of this of this uh, random single qubit gates. You 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 map it to computing commutant of uh, some set of operators in this in on the spin chain of t sides. So now now the you have to look at the dual chain, which is chain defined on t sides. Now uh, configuration space is now a time time lattice, and uh, there are two operators. One is simply magnetizations. And the other is this uh, interactions, if you want, arbitrary in homogeneous, homogeneous interactions. And you want to understand, and these are basically translation invariant operators, right? These operators are basically transla translation invariant sums. And then you want to ask, what is the commutant set? Meaning that what is the set of operators which simultaneously commute with these two B, these two, all these guys? And we know already a set of operators which do that, these are the translations, because these operators are translation invariant. So all the operators which do that are T translations. They are periodic translations on a time lattice. But what we need to show is that there are no other operators, namely that the T translations span the full com com uh, commutant of this, of this set. There is nothing else. So that's basically the idea how to prove ergodicity. I mean, that's, that's one way how to, I mean, okay, I don't want to 
again, here gets very technical and mathematical. So, but <clears throat> but I think I mean you get the flavor. I guess what is the what is the <clears throat> what is the mathematics behind this? Yeah, I mean it's, it's really very very different from you know from what people needed to do in semi classics. Yeah? Even though the result at the end of the day is very similar. <clears throat> Okay, now uh, how much time do I have? So I basically uh, navigate through the rest. Yeah, we have about five, 10 minutes more. Okay, so now the rest of my, my talk will be about something completely different. I mean, let's say from physics point of view, I mean, you might say, okay, this spectral correlations are something very academic. So maybe I don't I never, never care about this. So what if I'm just caring about your observables and uh, like transport, for example, the Kubo formulas of correlation functions and so on. So what about if I want to calculate correlation functions? And here is basically a statement of cor about correlation functions of these dual unitary circuits. So if you have a correlation function, then the correlation function you would compute in a circuit geometry like this, you would take two operators. Now this is a correlation function between two local operators. I will call them a uh, alpha and a beta. Suppose now again, you have D-level quantum systems, then you have a full set of local operators, which are by construction, let's say all possible traceless operators while A0 is identity. So basically you take operators such that the first operator is identity and the others are all orthogonal to identity, meaning they are traceless. So orthogonal in the Hilbert-Schmidt sense. So that's a natural ordering. Like this is the case for the Pauli operators. This is the case for the Gelman matrices. They are all, always, people always organize this way, this operator basis in this way. So we'd always be able to isolate uh, uh, traceless operators, right? And these are the physically interesting ones. So the traceable operator is identity, which is alpha equal to zero. So now we are only caring about alpha and beta different from zero. And now you take these two traceless operators, you place them at positions X and Y, and you shift one of them by T time, by, by, by time T in future, right? So basically what you have to do is basically you have to evaluate this type of diagram. You take a beta, you, you, you put, you, you equip it with U to the T and U to the minus T. So meaning that you, you basically fold it with, uh, with this uh, uh, time propagation and then you, you multiply it by a alpha and then you take the trace and take it the trace meaning is, is like considering periodic boundary conditions for this diagram in vertical and in horizontal directions. Horizontal direction simply means that you take periodic system but vertical periodic boundary conditions meaning that you take the trace. So that's, that's basically, what, basically what you have to do. And now you, you, you try to use unitarity and dual unitarity. And the fact that your circuit is dual unitary, meaning that the revolution is unitary in space and time direction, means that basically, I mean, now I'm just using words because I have no time and no interest to show you formulas, but uh, the, this, this basically gives you a, a quite deep statement about uh, all possible non-zero correlation functions. Namely, all possible non-zero correlation functions can now be only those which are propagating exactly with the speed of light or with the maximum speed of uh, uh, signal propagation, which is one in this case. I mean, this is like a quantum cellular automaton and speed of propagation is one. It's one, one, extra, one extra block per time step. And all other correlators should be zero. Why? Because we have this dual unitarity, meaning that the circuit is causal in space and it's causal in, it's causal in time, meaning that correlations are going only non-zero within the light cone, but it's causal in space. Correlations are only non-zero in this other light cone. So they are only non-zero on the intersection of two light cones, which is the light ray, right? So, I mean, this is basically a statement, a non-trivial statement about temporal, temporal correlations. Temporal correlations, space or temp spatial temporal correlations between two operators, alpha, beta. Uh, let's say X now is, uh, distance, is the distance between two points. I mean, I already uh, simplified it a bit. I didn't comment. I mean, this C, C plus C minus are defined like this. So this is already homogeneous coordinate X minus Y. And now you see this is a non-zero only when x minus y is equal to plus minus t. And in that case, correlation function can be contracted like this simple diagram. And this simple diagram is, you know, for those of you who have maybe seen something like this before, I mean, this is like uh, one of the representations of completely positive maps. I mean, this is like a basic, basic tool of quantum information of open systems. I mean, it's like you take this a beta as the initial state and then you propagate it by one time step, you just apply a completely positive map, which I call M plus here. And now you apply it T times or two T times. And now the correlation function is simply now one plus of correlation function of this one plus one D quantum system is now reduced to a 
temporal correlation function of a zero D dimension of zero D dynamical system, but it's open. It's now in this Krauss or, or Stein spring or whatever they call this representation, right? Of an open quantum system. So it's a, and it's, this is a completely positive map. It's not only completely positive, it's trace preserving and unitary. <clears throat> and it's more than that because this U is dual unitary. <clears throat> so it's a particular type of unitary maps. Okay, and now uh, just diagonalizing these unitary maps, you see that they have to have a spectrum inside unit disk. And depending whether there are eigenvalues on the unit circle or not, dynamics can either be non interacting, uh, non ergodic, ergodic but non mixing, or ergodic and mixing. I mean, I mean it's, too, it's not enough time to go through, through this uh, in detail, but for those of you who have experience in classical chaos theory, you know what I'm talking about. So, I mean, you, you can basically just uh, classify ergodic behaviors of these many body quantum systems according to this standard, let's say, uh, ergodic hierarchy nomenclature, ergodicity and mixing. Okay, uh, now I promised you that I will have a slide about full classification of dual unitaries for qubits, but I think I will safely skip that because it's just a technicality. I just already tell you, told you that in words. And uh, one other thing, now I'm just going through some slides quickly just to tell you what else one can compute, but not with any, any detail. So for example, one can compute, for example, also the operator spreading of, or, or operator, uh, uh, yeah, what people nowadays call operator spreading. So, um, or uh, <clears throat> sometimes also you, you, you hear word operator entanglement. So uh, looking at the uh, uh, entanglement of operators as a function of time, uh, which are growing because, you know, if you're starting with a local operator, applying the, 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 the quantum circuit, you basically uh, fatten it, right? Because uh, for example, take a local Pauli, you do one iteration of time, you take the, like a products of three Paulis, one to the left, one to the right, you take another step, you have string of five Paulis to, to the left, two to the right, and so on. There is this locality structure, which opens up. And you can consider this type of growing operator as a state, as a super state. And then you can consider its entanglement, its correlation structure. And, uh, you know, just look at the Schmidt decomposition, for example, with respect to some bipartition. And you find that this entanglement structure, entanglement spectrum, if you want, of this operator uh, has some universal features, yeah? And uh, this is, something which is characteristic for chaotic systems or for random circuits, if you want. So for example, this operator entanglement can grow, can grow at most linearly in time, can grow slower, can grow logarithmically, for example, if you have models which are localized, but models which are ergodic would have operator entanglement which grows linearly in time. And again, for this open quantum, for this dual unitary quantum circuits, we can provide some analytical results on operator entanglement growth. <clears throat> And even we can provide some sort of evidence of some kind of phase transition, non-equilibrium phase transition with respect to this J parameter. Now I didn't really tell you what J was, but it's kind of one key parameter in the parameterization of these dual unitaries. So J is really the chaos, you know, <clears throat> small J means chaotic and large J. J is equal to pi over four means swap, means non-interacting circuits, let's say. Now, I, of course, this is all in too quick, I guess. So I, I'm just giving you a flavor of that. So don't worry about this. Now, I had a hope that I would be able to tell you, tell you something about the last part, the last paper in the remaining few minutes, but I think, don't think I have remaining few minutes. So I'll just give you a short ad for that. I mean, it's a paper which was just published in PRX one, two months ago, uh, again with Bruno and Pavel. Uh, and the idea is basically, I just tell you the conclusion of the idea because the idea is why I think this should be kind of taken with some interest. I mean, you can again say, okay, I'm telling you about specific fine-tuned class of models. I mean, I can stretch my legs and say, okay, I mean, this is not so fine-tuned, but at the end of the day, it's still fine-tuned. So why should you care about this? Well, there is one simple reason why I think one should care about this because I believe, or there is an evidence, at least uh, some little evidence that this type of models can be structurally stable. And what does it mean? It means that, you know, it's similar again, if you remember your textbooks from dynamical systems, you've maybe seen somewhere that models like cat maps are structurally stable. So perturbed cat, cat has the same sort of topology of dynamics as cat maps. So nothing really changes with perturbed cat maps. So what if nothing really changes if you shake this type of models? 
So what if we can prove results of out ergodicity of perturbed, of perturbed dual unitary circuits? And this is what we are trying to do next. So this is the first step of this kind of program has been published in this paper. And of course, this has been very uh, in very limited context and under very constrained uh, condition and a very constrained type of perturbations. But still, I think it's a proof of concept. I mean, it, that it would, I mean, at least the conjecture or hypothesis makes sense that these models might be structurally stable. Okay, so now, I mean, I, this was just a few slides, but I don't want to. Okay, there is some nice uh, kind of diagrammatics, which basically is like, you know, I mean, if you let me just one minute, I mean, you know, when you are, when you're teaching many body physics or when you even, even you go to course on quantum field theory, I mean, you know, people tell you, okay, there is this nice Feynman diagrams and, you know, there is this free theories and you expand around free theories, you know, perturbative QFT and so on. Of course, it has all these problems of the world, but uh, it works sometimes very nicely. Sometimes you, you can do tricks, you subtract infinities and still works. You don't understand why it works and so on. Now I tell you, okay, maybe you should change the, 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 the program. And you, you take your favorite chaotic theory and you perturb that. So if you can solve your chaotic theory, and that's why I'm talking about exactly solved chaotic systems, because I claim first, there are some chaotic many body systems which you can solve. And in the next step, you perturb around them. And then here in this paper, we provided some convergent diagrammatics of perturbation theory around this, around this, around this, uh, <clears throat> let's say exactly solved chaotic points. Yeah. So this be, would be like the new free theories, let's say, uh, which would be stable with respect to perturbations. Of course, there is no hope, I guess, that the nature would be like that because nature is, this is just, again, this is probably still some remote corners. Yeah, but you know, there are probably might, might be very interesting corners of nature. <clears throat> Maybe some, something like quark gluon plasmas or something. I mean, and there's some very non-standard non, non, non conditions for us, but yeah. Okay, I mean, <clears throat> this was just, very speculative and very kind of colloquial. But let me just go to my conclusions. <clears throat> so uh, what I wanted to convince you is that we can provide some first results on spectral statistics of extended, extended quantum lattice systems, provided that thermodynamic limit is taken first. I mean, maybe I have, didn't have time to stress this enough, but here, you know, the, the condition was, of course, that you take thermodynamic limit and that is also some limitation. Uh, <clears throat> So in, under that condition, we could provide also exact results of spatial temporal correlation functions, and we can provide uh, examples from ergodic, from regular to ergodic and mixing dynamics, and even some, some evidence about structural stability of such, of such results to perturbations. Now, the main challenge, the, the other main challenges that I see to future, the future is that we would like really to see if some of these results remain also in finite systems. So, I mean, I would like also to take the other order of limits or to take the scaling limit of T to infinity and L to infinity at the same time. For example, suppose there is non-trivial tauless time, which would grow with a growing system size. Then if I take thermodynamic limit first, I'm always below the tauless time. So which means I never feel asymptotic physics. I never feel universal physics. So I, I mean lucky here because dual unitary systems are in this sense critical. There is no time scale which would separate universal from non-universal. That's why I can see universal physics. But in general, for, for non-dual unitary systems, I would have to have results for finite systems. I would have to have methods which address either scaling limits or finite systems. That's completely uh, un unclear. And uh, yeah, and then one very kind of, uh, I mean, kind of, um, nice goals to, for my taste would be to try to approve uh, statements like ETH, quantum ergodicity statements for eigenstates uh, for this type of models. Again, this would allow, this would first require that we control uh, the other order of limits because eigenstate thermalization means that you have eigenstates, meaning that you take thermodynamic, that you take time to infinity limit first and then take uh, asymptotic of large system. Okay, and then the last case would be also to go to <clears throat> maybe driven dissipative systems, uh, non-unitary systems, uh, <clears throat> which I have not even mentioned during my talk. So but basically it's not, but again, one can construct this type of dual, <clears throat> dual quantum, dual unitary, I mean, analogs of dual unitaries, which would be like uh, dual bistochastic uh, chains. Um, yeah, I'm happy to mention if anyone wants to ask anything like, uh, around that, but <clears throat> with this, I would like to thank for your attention. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, Thomas, for this very, very beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions, comments from the audience? Well, I would Maybe. certainly have a comment if there are no other yes. questions. Thomas. First of all, thank you, Thomas, for an interesting talk. Though it was long, it was quite exciting. And uh, as many of you know, I worked with Thomas since a very, very long time. I didn't follow him in this many body localization direction, but. Uh, uh, I was impressed because he was uh, the first numerically to show, I guess, in his most cited paper, that there could be something like that. It was a very impressive effort. And now uh, there were some uh, rumors going around and papers who claimed that they could prove that it always existed and certainly Thomas proved that it doesn't always exist because there are clearly counter examples. And that is in itself important. I believe you haven't pointed out that you have also some numerical evidence that even in these not exactly soluble models, uh, that it still seems not to go always all the way and maybe it will never go all the way. When I first saw it, I sort of intuitively said, it cannot be, it cannot be. There cannot be, in the strict sense, um, anybody localization, and it's almost proven, and uh, here it is. And uh, the, the point is that, uh, nevertheless, it is important, because we never have infinite systems. And if there is localization in sufficiently big systems, and they for things like quantum information, they don't need to be very big, uh, then it can be still very, very useful. So uh, I just want for those who are not so deep in to say there, that there is this very famous paper of Tomasz, uh, after only a few years, how many citations by now? Approaching 2000 or something is impressive. <laughs> Hello, yeah, thanks, Thomas, for these kind words. Uh, no, I, mean, I didn't mention these results, of course, because I wanted to focus on exact results. This is not exact, but it's a, a very interesting uh, potential direction to go. Through. I mean, I mean, I prepared one slide which I just skipped, but um, um, <clears throat> which I believe is, I mean, again, this is spec it's a speculative slide, so. Uh, but you know, this is a, some results on spectral form factor in generic circuits, non-dual unitary, and the idea is that uh, there should there might be some universal exponential decay of k of t minus t in time. So for uh, um, yeah, I mean, so that means that there would be there might be some sort of bound like this, and uh, that bound, I mean. Of course, I have no idea how to prove that bound. But if I if I can prove that bound for generic circuit for for any for any circuit, then um, then um, then of course I, I mean for any circuit for which I can prove that bound, of course there there is no way to lo of localization in thermodynamic limits. So <clears throat> um, yeah, but um, I, I can't say more. I mean I don't want to. I was too long anyway, but. It's an interesting, let's say, it's an interesting direction. It's just <clears throat> the way to put it. And I, know, I we annoy a lot of people with these claims, so. <laughs> okay, uh, are there further questions, comments? Uh, excuse me, uh, I have one question. Yes, yes, yes. go ahead. Uh, actually, I'm a little far away uh, from this uh, topic, but I just saw one uh, topic uh, means title over there that dynamical correlation. Is there any application? Actually, I'm working on uh, econophysics, time series analysis. Is there any application of that uh, dynamical correlation in time series analysis? Well, this is really far. So, um, of course, uh, I mean, 
I guess you know much more about time series than, than me. So there is, uh, I guess, lots of applications of correlations, right? So, uh, uh, how it is different than uh, like this dynamical correlation than simple peers in correlation, I'd say, I think, statistics. Uh, okay, so, well, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, so this, I should just go back to the definition of what I mean. <clears throat> so for me, dynamical correlation function is an object like this. And this is uh, simply, uh, I mean, if you want, this is a time correlation function of an operator at time zero times an operator at time t. You know, this is an operator under Heisenberg picture. So this is evolution of an operator in Heisenberg picture uh, for t time steps. And now we just evaluate the expectation value of the product of operators in a state. Of course, in quantum statistical mechanics, you have to put a state here, which is invariant of the time. But there is no invariant state here in general other than the infinite temperature or tracial state, which means you take a trace. Okay. So that's the only kind of generally time invariant state. So that's the only kind of meaningful, thermodynamically meaningful time correlation function. Okay. In this case, time correlation function should be, you know, function of, which should be homogeneous, only function of the difference of times at which you evaluate two observers. <clears throat> So in that sense, these are the standard statistic equilibrium correlation function, equilibrium time correlation functions. Okay. I'm not sure then how is this, I mean, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, this is written in terms of quantum language. So it's not, it's not the same as Pearson correlator uh, in time series, but, but of course there is kind of, I mean, it, there is connection of course, because they are both characterizing correlations. So <clears throat> I don't know what to say, yes, I mean, what, it's, it's of course two different things. I mean, as contexts are very different, yeah, but. I can those... make a brief comment if you wish. The, yeah. uh, I mean, th th there is a line of work which I haven't pursued, well, I have observed it. I haven't done any research in it where you, with classical correlations, there are two lines, one is, to compare a correlation function at one time to a correlation matrix at one time to correlate it with a correlation matrix at a different time. There's actually a friend here in Mexico who does that among others, but it is sort of terrible in the dimension of a problem, of a problem you get. Or you can simply correlate the time series with, a, with the same or, well, a set of time series with, an, with the same set, but shifted by a certain amount in time. And that uh, will give a non-symmetric matrix. And then there is a whole uh, bunch of mathematics about these time-shifted series which are sort of like the off diagonal blocks if you put them like separate time series. And uh, it's um, uh, complex eigenvalues. It gets messy. There are results. I'm not sure to what point they have been actually applied to practical problems. But they are quite interesting and then hating results. Among others, my friend Hinayak has published on that. Maybe together with Luis Bennett, I'm not quite sure. He should be here probably. Am I right, Luis? I think he was here, but yes. already left. Yes, he has left. I think they published something together on the subject. Okay, are there further questions, comments? Thomas, I have I have a question. Uh, you showed this for this uh, um, uh, fermionic interacting chain. You showed this even odd effects in time. It is in the K function. Um, are there any um, experimental uh, proofs of some properties? Are you aware of something like this, or let's no. say uh, experimental? No, not, actually, that's not that's not actually so difficult. So, uh, I mean, we have been discussing with some uh, guy from New York already, and uh, mm -hmm. well, 
I mean, it, I don't know what happened afterwards, but uh, as far, I mean, it's okay, it's not trivial, but it's also not impossible, I think, to mm -hmm. measure these things. So I think eventually, which, which actually, there would... is a, that, there actually, no, sorry, there was a paper by Zoller actually, who actually proposed three really concrete measurement of spectral form factors. So, so I can actually even dig this out for you if you want. I mean, there was a paper by Zoller in 2020, beginning uh -huh. of 2020, uh, his group, who proposed really the what to, I mean, how to approach this uh, measurement. Um, but I, it was not implemented yet, so it was just mm -hmm. a measurement proposal. The implementations would be in quantum optics or? Yeah, in atom optics, yeah. Okay. But uh, of course, I mean, now, of course, in, in, in case you are able to measure it, then uh, you should see that even out effects, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is kind of cute, yeah, because yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, <laughs> yeah. 2t versus 2t plus one, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, and we can explain that. I mean, this plus one is an additional eigenvector of this dual transfer matrix, yeah. which has very defined structure. I see, um, I see. In our PRL, we discuss, discuss it, yeah. I see, I see. <laughs> Okay, uh, the, the other question which I have you mentioned um, uh, just after these results uh, to go to physical observables, you mentioned transport. So I don't know if you can comment. Um, yeah, no, I, yeah, it's an interesting question. And uh, of course, I didn't go, I, I didn't comment during my talk, but I'm happy to comment. Um, the, the models that I discussed in my talk, of course, allow no transport because there are no conserved quantities. Yeah. Uh, but people have looked into this type of models with conserved quantities. And even within this class of dual unitary circuits, we could engineer circuits with conserved quantities. Mm -hmm. So you, the simplest thing would be, of course, you can take, I mean, what you should, you might think of conserved energy, right? I mean, but that, for that, you should go to continuous time. But that means that you lose this uh, space-time duality picture. <clears throat> I mean, if you go to continuous time, you do the throttle limit, and then it, you become very asymmetric between space and time because you are in a, on a lattice in space, mm -hmm. but time ceases to become a lattice; it's becoming a continuum. <clears throat> so, you, you, if you want to keep this dual unitarity structure uh, and being having lattices in space and time, then you should engineer other type of conserved quantities, and the simplest one is some sort of particle conserv number conservation. So you take some uh, U1 charge, if you want. <clears throat> and this has been done. I mean, there is a paper by, 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 by I think, yeah, by, by the group from Oxford, by Andrea De Luca and John Choker, not the one I mentioned, but the after, later paper, 2019, where they consider these flocky quantum circuits with the U1 charge. And they find that, uh, yeah, they, they look at the correlation, no, they, there they look at the spectral form factor and they find that the tau less time then, then is L squared over D. L square is now, I mean, system size square over diffusion constant, as you would expect, you know, mm -hmm. based on the original idea of what tallest time yeah. is, right? It's connected to diffusion, yeah, and that's finite time for diffusion to spread. <clears throat> so that's I what see. you get, and it's, it's kind of nice and reassuring, but, but for that you have to put mm -hmm. conservation laws by hand, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, one more question. Isn't... Would it be possible to make any spin wave transports? Uh, what do you mean? By spin I mean, wave? if you think of qubits, you could think of spins. Yes. And then there is all this uh, that, that you excite on one hand that the spin wave will go through the system. Yeah, but I guess you need some sort of U1 symmetry, no? You need at least U1 symmetry for that. Like, like in XXZ, no? Uh -huh. uh, in order to have spin waves, you need uh, U1 symmetry. Otherwise, this, yeah. this will not uh, work. So I think then you should, I mean, it is possible. I mean, we, we didn't do this yet, but it's possible to pro produce uh, this type of models with U1 symmetries, which would have, if you want to call them spin waves. And then, it's not clear. It's not clear what this dual unitarity would imply for for the correlation functions of that. <clears throat> I mean, you might expect diffusion in terms of, but it's not clear because you have this this confinement to light rays. Uh, the correlation functions really uh, in space time they only decay on light rays and they are zero outside light outside this light rays. So 
it might have some consequences also to, to, to transport. <clears throat> but it's not been investigated. Okay. Are there further questions, comments? Well, if this is not the case, Thomas, thank you again. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. We are Zoom. We all would have preferred to do this in person, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope it will be possible the next time. To have yeah, you here in Cuernavaca. Normal soon. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then thank you very much to all of you and 